Welcome back. Most of us are well aware of the opioid addiction crisis throughout the country, but especially right here in our region. Unlike many addiction epidemics in the past, this one is larger and is hitting a new and different population, one involving white, middle class, suburban and rural populations. Not to say this is all that are affected, but it's an epidemic unlike any that we've seen in modern American history. In many studies and work on this topic, I've found that one of my friends from my hometown in East Tennessee had not only been addicted, but has recovered and is now helping others recover from this addiction. I was able to sit down with Lee Ann Ripito and part of her family to talk about her journey through opioid addiction and the road to recovery. Lee Ann Ripito grew up and currently lives in the quaint northeast Tennessee town of Johnson City within the Tri-Cities. I lived there for 19 years myself through grade school, college at East Tennessee State University and medical school. During my years in middle school and high school, I was friends with Lee Ann, but at some point, life took a different turn than most of us who grew up in the region. East Tennessee is about as American as it gets, with beautiful mountains, local eateries, a university, and revived Main Street. It's a region that prides itself on the love of God and the good old USA. It's a beautiful part of the country, but much like the rest of Appalachia and cities around the country, it hides a secret, prescription opioid abuse. The opioid abuse epidemic of the last 15 to 20 years has addicted millions and killed hundreds of thousands. It is a deadly spiral that often starts with a prescription from a doctor for a painful condition, but in time the person becomes addicted and as more time passes, the needs and doses increase, eventually leading to more invasive administration and often a transition to heroin. With opioid legislation and an influx of cheap yet potent heroin, the transition is one of necessity and economics. Unfortunately, thousands each year will pay the price with their life. Leanne told me how her high school days at Science Hill High School included the usual classes and events, but weekends meant hanging out with friends, parties with alcohol and marijuana, but overall, it was a white picket fence, suburbia kind of life. My parents are still married. They've been married for over 45 years. They, um, they have um, both have great jobs. Um, they we have there are four kids in our family. My father um, had an airplane as I was growing up and put a swimming pool in our backyard. And we had horses and we had um, things that I thought honestly I actually thought were normal for when when you're young. Everybody has that. We were. Um, in a private Christian school, we went to we we were we were in um, private tr Christian school until we were till my twin sister and I were in third grade. So, the our lifestyle, or to look on look at us from the outside, everyone thought we had the perfect upbringing, the perfect lifestyle. It wasn't until she was prescribed Percocet for persistent migraines that her downward spiral began. Yes, it was a, a Percocet prescription intended just to treat headaches as needed, and um, and I think the prescription, and it's I guess it may be weird that I know this, but it was supposed to be taken one every six hours as needed, and that prescription should have lasted me a week if not longer, and it lasted me two days, and um, because after the first pill I realized kind of, I had a worse headache, but I didn't feel what, I didn't need to worry about the headache. It was, the, the headache was the least of, of my issues at that point. I, I could almost become um, anybody on that medicine. So the doctor's visit wasn't fishing. I didn't go fishing for narcotics. I went legitimately with an issue, um, and the doctor wrote that prescription legitimately thinking I was going to take it how it was designed to take and you know um, that just didn't happen so that one pill bottle and that one prescription um, stayed in my pocket for a matter of two days before it was empty. It spun out of control so quickly I could never get a hold of it. Disease of addiction is so cunning and baffling that it comes at you in every form wrapped up in the best packages and it almost sneaks in when you least expect it. As her addiction grew and grew, Leanne faced the challenges of a growing dependence and increasing need for drugs. She became desperate. She began using her nursing license and job to fill prescriptions at pharmacies around the city. She told me that she would clean up, dress as nice as possible, and go into those pharmacies with falsified prescriptions in order to get what she needed. But eventually, the law caught up. She remembered hearing rumors that the police were looking for her, but she never truly believed it until the police knocked on her door. 
all of my criminal charges spurred from me filling prescriptions that were not in my name or were not to me and filling prescriptions fraudulently and the um, along with those fraudulent charges came um, tacked on accessory conspiracy forgery identity theft criminal simulation uh, criminal impersonation um, those were things I they that uh, that went along with filling a, a fraudulent prescription. She also notes that jail is not the answer to the addiction crisis. There was nothing about jail that that um, that taught me anything other than that I didn't want to go back there and how to become a better criminal, how to hide things better, how not to go back, and not how to get clean. As her addiction spun further and further out of control, Leanne recalls that her role as parent flipped. When you're a mom and your child gets sick, you rub your child's back if they're getting sick, physically sick. You're in there. You're there and you're present. And you are that one who rubs their back and gets that washcloth and talks them through that and helps them through that and gets them back in bed and, and watches them. So I was the mom that, that ultimately turned into the child. I'm the one who was sick daily throwing up from being so high where my three-year-old came to me and rubbed my back and talked me through being sick. Her oldest child, Maddie, started feeling this change as well. I remember always being the mom figure normally for my brothers. In a good way, I was always there for them, but I had to take the memory away from it. So I would I would do it again just to take care of them so they would never have to remember what went on during their childhood. But it kind of haunts, I guess, my childhood. Later, she started noticing that something weird was going on. It was some of my stuff would get sold for money. Like I had this favorite puppy and his name was Duke and he got sold for money. It was just when I got older, I was able to catch on to all the little things that they didn't think were obvious because they weren't in the right mindset, but to me they were obvious. And especially when my grandparents were always over at our house trying to check on us or something, I mean, they knew we weren't in a good environment, so they were trying to change that. Eventually, after arrested, losing her home, her children, and about everything she had, she reached rock bottom. At the urging of her father, she looked for help, but in reality, she didn't feel ready. I was not prepared to hear those words, and I honestly was prepared for a four to six week waiting period. So the words, I have a bed and you have 20 minutes, and um, just were like a, a, um, a punch in the gut for me. As Leanne recovered, she found that one of the gifts of her addiction and subsequent recovery is that she can help others navigate the same path. She talks about the challenge of sobriety. She also has a message for others who are fighting addiction. The obstacles that are placed in front of you day one, going back to just for today, there's still a possibility to recover. Recovery is possible. Placing the right things and the right people in your path is very crucial to recovery. Maybe a message is get clean whichever way works for you because recovery will work as long as you work the program. There's two things I hope that you can get from Leanne's story. One is hope. If you have a family member or you yourself have an addiction issue, there is hope out there. There's help out there. You need to seek it. Accept that you have a problem and get the help you need. Recovery is not a quick process. It's a daily commitment to being better and making the right choices from today on. As Leanne says, today is your first day of recovery. In second, understanding that the addictions we're seeing now aren't the same addictions we used to see. These aren't the inner city addictions that we see in homeless folks that we've allowed to sweep under the rugs for generations. These are among our friends, our family members, those within our church, our friendship circles, through our schools, through our employment. People we know and work with are suffering from these addictions. So we need to understand that they're out there, realize that this is a fact, and do what we can to get folks out of the grips of addiction. I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton for Stanton, MD. This is actually just excerpts from the full interview with Leanne. The full discussion includes over an hour in content that we'll make available on Stanton MD for you to watch and share as well. The more we understand this crisis, the better prepared we'll be to help people recover. 
That's all the time we have for this episode of Stanton MD. Please visit the Stanton MD website for episodes and more information about the show and our sponsors. Also, like us on Facebook for more information and content. Learn more about our sponsors as well. Also, if your business has technology or a practice that promotes health and safety and you want to be featured on Stanton MD, contact us at info at stantonmd.com. That's info at stantonmd.com. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton and this has been Stanton MD.